Uh, let's welcome everyone. You can let's stand and we'll begin singing Standing on the Promises of God.
with our scripture reading this morning, let's uh, turn to um, Daniel. We're in the book of Daniel, and uh, this, this wasn't my original pick. I had picked a psalm to read this morning, but uh, uh, the more I was, uh, how, how, how can we put it, thinking about uh, Daniel, uh, his prayer, uh, no, I can't find Daniel. It, it's in here, though. It's, uh, it, it's right before Hosea. I got it. All right, Daniel chapter 2. And this basically is his prayer uh, before he goes into the king uh, to explain the dream that the king uh, has had. And so in Daniel chapter 2, um, beginning in uh, verse 17, let's, uh, let's, let's pick it up. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And notice, uh, he doesn't use their pagan names. Uh, their, their Jewish names are used, which is an indication that the uh, brainwashing of Nebuchadnezzar in changing their names was part of that, uh, wasn't being as successful, at least with these four, as, uh, as they would have hoped. Verse 18, that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what he desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. And so note who gets the credit in this prayer. It's all of God. Let's, uh, let's us go to prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you, you are. We thank you that you are all powerful, that you are all knowing, that you have things under control. And that at the same time, you are a merciful God, a forgiving God. We thank you for this. And as we think of any accomplishments uh, that we have, of any blessings that we have, we pray that we, like Daniel, would never take the credit ourselves, but we would be thankful to God, who is the source of blessing. And so we, we thank you for this example right here. We want to... Uh, Remember, those uh, our friends, those who are associated with us with their uh, illnesses, we uh, just commit each one to you, and we just pray that your will, um, uh, well, we know your will will be worked out, but we just pray that, that uh, uh, each person could be used in a great way and learn more about the greatness of God through any trials and troubles that are going through. And so we, we commit each one to you. We want to commit our country to you. We thank you for it. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. And we just pray that we would be uh, responsible citizens, that uh, uh, we would be the kind of citizens that not only make our communities a better place to live, but the kind of citizens who recognizes that Jesus Christ is the hope of this country. And help us never to forget that, 
that without Christ, without your word, uh, we are sunk. And so as we see uh, a lot of growing hostility to the very biblical principles, to the Bible itself, uh, we pray for our country and we just pray that uh, there could be many people that wake up to the truth of your word. And so we commit that to you. We want to commit this morning to you. We thank you for the freedom we have to gather together. We just pray that the time spent around your word uh, would be uh, profitable in many ways, encouraging, educational. Uh, we just uh, pray that the more we learn about who you are, the, uh, uh, the more settled we can become. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to the book of Daniel. And as we uh, think of Daniel, and before we get right into Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which uh, uh, the prophecy will uh, be talking about next week and probably a couple of weeks uh, out, but as we think of this man Daniel and his three friends, uh, what we've noticed in the past is that uh, Daniel was... Uh, is the most comprehensive prophecy in the Old Testament. Uh, it, it lays out a chronology of prophecy that, unlike any others. And then we notice there was an outline of the book of, of uh, Daniel, and we can outline it in how it was written. It was written in two languages. Uh, Daniel 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, is written in the Hebrew language. And it's basically God's plan for Daniel. So that could be Roman numeral number one. Uh, and from Daniel 2, uh, verse 4 through 9, 28, it was written in Aramaic. And we could make this Roman numeral uh, number two, God's plan for Gentiles. And then... Uh, uh, 
that, would, that, that should be uh, 10, okay, uh, through chapter 12, it's then written in Hebrew again, and this is God's plan for Israel. That can be uh, Roman numeral number three. So there's an outline uh, of the book of Daniel. Uh, we noted last week that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a three-year brainwashing plan for the captives. Uh, they were uh, primarily focused on three major areas uh, to break down any patriotism. Uh, and they did that by teaching the culture and the language. And, uh, and then to destroy uh, individualism. And uh, for lack of a better term, uh, the idea there is, is that uh, Nebuchadnezzar set up a dependent system where the uh, uh, captives would be totally dependent for all their food, for all their care, a kind of a cradle-to-the-grave mentality. Um, and uh, this would cause them what? To depend upon the state. Uh, and then they destroyed their sense of their relationship to God. Uh, this was the plan. Uh, we can't have any, any biblical beliefs that are going on in our new culture that we have for you. And so the primary thing they did there is they changed their names to give them a different identity. We took a, a, a quick look last week or uh, took some time to go through uh, what these names mean. Their Hebrew names had some very significant uh, meaning about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of creation, uh, the all-powerful God. Uh, and yet their Babylonian names uh, Belteshazzar, and we're all pretty familiar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In fact, how do we put it? Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That logically doesn't follow. It should be Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. And all of those are associated with the pagan gods of the Chaldeans. And, uh, and so uh, that was his plan. We also noted in uh, verse 8 of chapter 1 that Daniel made up his mind. He purposed in his heart. Uh, he was resolute uh, about not defiling himself. And some of the things we observed were he rejected the herd mentality. Uh, he honored a biblical or divine viewpoint. He wasn't rude or kind of crazy. He didn't, you know, threaten to go on a hunger strike or anything like that. Or, or uh, uh, and he he could have done that. Uh, in fact, I know there's people that probably would. They'd turn their nose up and say, uh, "You guys are crazy. I'm not going to eat this junk." He didn't say that. He was polite. Uh, and, uh, and he was very responsible and reasonable. Uh, when the, uh, his, uh, how can I put it, his boss, uh, the person, the commander that was put in charge, uh, told him, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my head if you guys don't turn out the way uh, you're supposed to. Uh, the uh, uh, verse 10 of Daniel 1, and the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear the Lord King. Now it's interesting that that prince that was put in charge literally made Nebuchadnezzar his God. He feared the king. Daniel feared the God of heaven. And it made a, 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 gave him a mindset that uh, really gave him some... Uh, alternative choices that he could make that are good. And he did exactly that. I fear my Lord the King who hath given orders. He's appointed your meat and your drink, which indicates that the menu that the Babylonians had was designed to do what? To inculcate these into the Babylonian culture. And so they had everything 
uh, worked out. Nebuchadnezzar was uh, no dummy. Uh, he was an intelligent man as far as uh, being a, a leader. Uh, and he knew what he wanted, and he knew how to get it. Uh, but why should he set your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. So then what we notice is that Daniel was very reasonable. He says, okay. And basically what he's saying, I understand your dilemma from your point of view. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that people come from different points of view. And to just say, you know what? You're all wet. You're out to lunch. Uh, you think what? No, Daniel didn't do that. He said, okay, uh, let's, would you give us a test? Just a 10-day test. And then you be the judge, and we will literally obey your conclusion. And the guy said, yes, I'll do that. I'll give you a test for 10 days. And so, uh, uh, verse 12, prove thy uh, servants, I beseech thee, 10 days, and let them give us pulse to eat, or that's vegetables, basically, and water to drink. Then you be the judge. And, uh, and as thou seest, the end of the verse, you deal with us, your servants. Very polite, very uh, submissive, yet very firm and uh, very um, uh, sure uh, as he made this uh, request. So he consented to them in this matter, improved them 10 days, and at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the person or the portion of the king's meat. So I don't know what all was involved, but apparently in 10 days, it was visibly noted that uh, the skin tone, everything about these uh, young men was just a little better than the rest who was on the diet. And, uh, and what could his uh, master say? Uh, I agreed to the test. You passed the test. And so what happened then is uh, uh, Melzar, which is actually a, a term that means uh, commander or something like that, uh, supervisor, took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them vegetables. Uh, and then we noted this, that in verse 17, and as for these four children, uh, and we don't know exactly the age of children, but uh, uh, the customs of those days, at least the Persians following Babylon, uh, 14 to 17 was their age that would fit this particular category. And so these are, uh, are, are teenagers. And uh, this is amazing when you stop and you think of teenagers. Teenagers, one of the things that is uh, uh, characteristic of your teen years is you really are herd bound. Uh, I mean, I didn't do this, but I know there was girls in the class, they would actually call or you would hear them say, um, what are you wearing tomorrow? Did any of you do that? Okay. Um, well, what do you care what you're doing? Uh, the one that got me was, uh, I have to go to the bathroom. You want to come with? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, there's some things I'd rather do alone. That was kind of a girl thing. But we tend to be what? Herd bound. Uh, we don't want to stick out. We, it's just natural for us to to want to go along with the crowd. Why? So that we'll be accepted. And what we see in Daniel is he was more concerned with being accepted by his God than he was the people around him. And that should be the mindset that we have. We should be concerned about what God thinks we should be concerned with, are we lining up with him? And when we do that, guess what happens? Remember back in, what is it, verse 9? Um, and God 
uh, of chapter 1, Now God had brought Daniel into favor, favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Uh, you know that God will take care of your friends. You know, it's real easy for us. Well, I've got to pick some good friends, and, and who should my friends be? Listen, you focus on what God has for you, and he'll bring people in your life, and you'll have better friends, maybe not as many, uh, as far as we know, these four pretty much stood alone. Um, there might have had some others that were kind of on the fence with them, other Jewish people, but I'll tell you what, when they bowed down to the image, Daniel wasn't there, but these three didn't bow down and they were alone. And so you might not have many friends, but I'll tell you this, you'll have good friends. And that's what we'll see in this uh, uh, in this passage as, as we uh, go on. And so Daniel's request in, in uh, verses 10 through 17, we just looked at it, and uh, they passed the test. And I don't know, uh, except for coloring, and it says fatness, so apparently they, they, uh, they didn't get weak and shrivel up. We'll just put it that way. Uh, I think they're probably physically in, in pretty good shape. Um, and they probably did their sit-ups and push-ups and all of that stuff, too. And then uh, uh, there is a, at the end of the days, verse 18, that the king had said he should bring them in. And uh, it's interesting that in the beginning of the chapter, this was to be a three-year uh, training that they went through. So here, this would indicate to us that Three years in chapter 18, even though when we go to chapter 2, it's two years. And, uh, uh, and yet, they're brought in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king commanded or communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Now, King Cyrus is uh, a long time after this. So uh, what we can conclude is this, is that this is kind of a summary of Daniel's life. And after three years, um, <coughs> he was brought in with the rest, and they were examined. And in those days, in fact, still today, uh, if you study for a Ph.D. or some uh, real advanced de uh, degree, it's not uncommon to have to go in front of a board or a, a front of uh, you know three other Ph.D.s, <coughs> and they question you about your thesis. They question you, and they evaluate you. And oftentimes, you can tell a lot about a person, how sharp they are by looking them in the eye, and uh, uh, how do they respond? Do they respond with confidence? Do they know what they're talking about? And every one of us have run into people who, you know, it's, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. You, you feel like saying, uh, you know, just keep talking. You'll think of something to say. Uh, no, don't say that. Uh, I'll say that. No, the, uh, uh, that's rude. But you know exactly what I'm talking about. And sometimes people, they just know what they're talking about. And this was Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar is just impressed with these guys. And I don't know how you would evaluate if someone's 10 times sharper than anyone else, but we use that phrase today, don't we? Uh, oh, man, this is 10 times better than anything else, and we've never mathematically figured it all out. Well, this was Nebuchadnezzar speaking, and he's saying, man, these guys are 10 times better than all my, my other people. And uh, Daniel was promoted. And, uh, and so as we think of of what's happening here in uh, uh, through verse 20 and then verse 21, we then come to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2. And as we 
Think of this right here. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Now, it looks like in that passage that he had more than one dream and, uh, and how long that took, but what we're really going to focus on is one dream in particular that he had. And uh, this dream troubled Nebuchadnezzar. And as we stop and we think of uh, the, uh, the dream and what it means, I wrote here uh, four basic ways, and uh, God used prophets, but he talked to them in these ways. Uh, there was the angel of the Lord. Now, I believe the angel of the Lord was actually a pre-incarnate uh, Jesus Christ who actually showed up and he gave uh, instructions. The angel of the Lord showed up to, with Abraham and Sarah uh, and in other places in the scripture and he related revelation. Uh, there was also direct conversation there was also visions, and there were dreams. And in the scripture, it's often that a distinction is made between a vision and a dream. So me, I ask the question, what's the difference between a vision and a dream? Uh, Peter, when the uh, 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 sheet came down, it was a vision. In fact, he went up to the room to pray, and he fell in a trance and saw a vision. Doesn't even say he was sleeping. We kind of think he fell asleep. We use it that way. But he saw something. And it was a supernatural phenomenon. Uh, that's an example of that. Uh, and then there's a dream. And a dream is kind of interesting. Uh, it's a uh, uh, natural thing. I, I've heard, heard said that all of us dream. Uh, if, it, if you're like me, I don't remember most of the dreams in the morning, but they say that you, we all dream. Um, is that, does anybody know that that's true or not? I, I don't know, but uh, some of you remember your dreams, and some of you have nightmares, and, uh, uh, and it's not uncommon to ask, oh, what does that mean? And uh, some people really get afraid of their own dreams. But dream is a common phenomenon and it's used by God to reveal a truth. And I'd like us just to turn back to the book of Numbers, chapter 12. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book in the Bible. And look at an example of uh, three of these uh, in this particular passage. Numbers chapter 12, and I'll just pick it up in verse 6, and here's what we read. And he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. <clears throat> My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, and in other places he describes it as face to face, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall, be, shall he behold. Wherefore then, were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Well, we have a vision mentioned, we have a dream mentioned, and we have God speaking face to face. Now, that didn't happen a whole lot in the Old Testament. And Moses is the uh, most, uh, what, how can I put it, the most prolific when it comes to God speaking face to face. In fact, if we studied Moses, what we would find is that God actually had a conversation with him. And he sat down and he talked like two friends would talk. Uh, he talked face to face. Not real common in the scripture, but it's a direct conversation. And then he mentions visions, and then he mentioned dreams. And I might just say this, that dreams in the Bible, 
that God uses. In fact, the Bible says there's dreams that spread lies. Not every dream is of God. And it's important that we understand that. But it's also important for us to understand that God actually at this time used dreams to convey truth. And it wasn't always through believers. In fact, if you uh, look at the Bible, I think there's about 16 dreams that are recorded in the Old Testament. Uh, two of them were by Pharaoh. Uh, two of them is Nebuchadnezzar. One of them was Abimelech. Remember, Abimelech, and none of these guys were saved or believers. Abimelech, he was a, uh, a king who uh, wanted to build his harem and saw Abraham's wife, Sarah, and said, whoa, she's a looker. And he takes her into his harem, and God sends him a dream and says, you better keep your hands off of her. Uh, she is a married woman. And uh, he listens to it, and he sends her back uh, to her husband, uh, Abraham. God used a dream to convey this truth to an, an unbeliever. If you remember, Pharaoh's butler had a dream. Uh, Pharaoh's baker had a dream. Uh, as far as we know, those guys weren't believers in, uh, in Jesus Christ at all. Um, the, uh, in the New Testament, and, and so what's the, what's the point? Okay, the point is, is that God can use dreams, but if God conveys some truth in a dream, it's the truth that's important, not the person who the dream comes through. And that, that's, that's an important point. Uh, there's people today that have a dream, and I'll tell you what, uh, they are convinced that it's God speaking to them directly. And, and the Bible warns against that. In the New Testament, Jude talks about dreams of liars. And uh, beware. Uh, in the New Testament, um, I think there's uh, six dreams recorded. Uh, there's some visions. I mentioned Peter. Uh, not, not too many. Uh, who had dreams? Well, Joseph had four of the dreams that are recorded in Scripture. Um, the, uh, the wife of Pilate had a dream. In fact, just before Pilate sentenced Jesus, he's standing up in front of the crowd, and they are going to chant, we want Barabbas, give us Barabbas, instead of Jesus. And Pilate's wife says, I had a dream and I'm scared to death. You are going to sentence a innocent man. Let this just man go. And uh, he didn't do it. He, the crowd got to Pilate. But Pilate's wife, and I don't know if Pilate's wife was a believer or not. Uh, there's, that's about the only verse in the Bible that, uh, that talks about her. Um, and so the... Uh, uh, Dreams. I just want to make that point um, about dreams. Uh, any questions about that? So anybody's got you know questions about how God worked? Um, in Hebrews chapter one, we're told this: that in times past, He spoke in various ways, and dreams, visions are mentioned, but today. He speaks through his son. And what we find in the New Testament is the dreams fizzled out. So did the visions. And they fizzled out directly coordinated with the completion of the scripture. In fact, Peter says this. We have a more sure word of prophecy. So you know what that means? If you have a Bible, and I stand up here and say, listen, I had a dream, and it was the Holy Ghost that came upon me, and uh, I want you people to listen to what the Holy Ghost said through me. You know what you should do? Open your Bible and verify everything that's said through the Word of God. Verifiability is a very important aspect of uh, understanding uh, what, uh, uh, what God is talking about and, uh, and what people say. Don't be afraid. 
to compare it to the scripture. You don't have to be obnoxious about it, but uh, is, is this in the Bible? Where do you get that? Well, it's not in the Bible, but you know, not everything's in the Bible, is it? I mean, God wants us to know more than it's just in the Bible. No, listen. In the Bible is everything we need to know. Is there more information outside of the scripture? Yep, but we don't need it. God, we're, he talked about creation to the new heavens and new earth and everything we need. In fact, he says everything pertaining to life is found in the manual right here. Uh, we've got enough to do to open the book than to look for extra biblical uh, revelation. And so, but in, before the Bible was completed, this is how God conveyed his truth. Well, uh, after the dream, the king calls his whole cabinet. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2 and take a look. Verse 2, then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Now, I just want to make a comment about these, uh, this group. The magicians, they're associated with the occult. The astrologers, well, they're the stargazers and they can tell the fortune, you know, are you a... Are you a Taurus or, uh, you know, what are the uh, horoscope things? Uh, that's what they're into. The sorcerers were into witchcraft. The Chaldeans, they were the intelligentsia. Uh, they were the bishops, the priests. Uh, and what we have here is this really represented the whole religious system of Babylon. So the king called in all the heavy hitters uh, that were uh, not only his advisors, but were the leaders of the uh, religious atmosphere in Babylon. And what we find in this, and get this point, the request of the king is going to show up religion. What these people are incapable of doing and, uh, uh, and there's a, a lesson that uh, Nebuchadnezzar should have learned. Uh, apparently he learned it later, but at this point, when you compare what's going to happen with Daniel and what happened with these guys, uh, if you want to call something or someone a loser, these are the losers right here, uh, in, in this right here. And so here's the request that the king made. Let's read it in verse 3. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the meaning of the dream. And uh, uh, then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, their language, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Well, that is pretty extreme. Verse 6, But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. As we stop and we think of this uh, request and the demands that the king made, um, the response of the cabinet is, this is unreasonable. How do we know what your dream is? And the mindset of, uh, of the king was, uh, was this. If you know the interpretation, you should know the dream. And their mindset was, you tell us the, inter uh, the dream and we will uh, make up an interpretation. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar was afraid of. Because, you see, there is no way to verify what the meaning of something is. These guys could come up with anything. And I think in the back of Nebuchadnezzar's mind, he knew that 
Uh, and dreams were important in those days. They, they looked at them as great meaning. Nebuchadnezzar knew. Now, there are uh, several theologians that think that Nebuchadnezzar really did remember the dream. He just told them it's there. And so his test is this. If you can tell me the dream, I'll know you're on the right track. If you can tell me the dream, then I know you should have some ability to interpret the dream. But if you can't tell me the dream, you guys are out to lunch. The, uh, uh, the response is, uh, is this. Verse 10. Uh, well, he goes, uh, verse 9. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I'll know that ye shall show me the interpretation. And the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, Lord, nor ruler that asketh such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king required, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods. Now, it's kind of interesting that they actually were partially right here. Uh, human beings can't see in the hearts of other people. If you had a dream, how would, how would anyone ever know what your dream is if you didn't say it? Uh, did anybody have a dream last night? Well, I'll look at you and I'll tell you what that dream is. No, that doesn't work that way. Um, the, uh, not at all. And uh, what they said is this. Only the gods know that. Now, they're making reference to their gods, but they are correct that only God would know what's in the hearts. But then they added this at the end, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now, if I could interpret that, it's this. Only our gods know, but they're not talking. They're not telling us. Oh, really? You mean you worship gods? that have hands that don't work, that has mouths that don't speak, that have ears but can't hear. Uh, remember those stories in the Old Testament? This is how God describes their gods. And they're kind of admitting that right here, that only the gods know this, but they're not talking. They don't let us know. Uh, they don't let us know anything, actually. So this is unreasonable. And the king is saying, you know what? You guys have been on the payroll and I'm paying you for this. I'm going to kill you all. And, uh, and so, apparently, Daniel wasn't there. And it's probably explained because chapter 1 kind of gives a broad overview of his life. This is two years in. And Daniel is probably still in the dormitories with his three buddies. And, uh, and for this cause, the king was angry verse 12, and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So it wasn't just the ones that went in front of him. The king just, he went berserk. And uh, he just says, kill them all. All the wise men. They're all, a, a, it's all a fraud. Whether they're here or not, kill them all. And that would have included the university that Daniel and his buddies were going to. And, uh, and verse 13 says that, that that included Daniel and his fellows. Verse 14, then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch told Daniel the whole story. And, uh, and so that we have this order of death and we have Daniel's response. 
And Daniel trusts the Lord. And there's some evidence of that in this passage right here. He showed control, self-control. You know, one of the uh, fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Daniel had mental control. Uh, what do we read here? Uh, he answered with counsel and wisdom. He wasn't threatening. Uh, he was inquiring very politely. Uh, and he had courage in all this. Look at verse uh, 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Uh, as we think of courage there, we also have confidence. Uh, in the original, it, it doesn't give the idea that if you give me time, I'll go to the Lord and maybe he'll show me and maybe he won't. Oh no, Daniel says, you give me time and God will show me the interpretation. He had confidence right here. And so Daniel was trusting the Lord and it showed up in this. Uh, I don't know what I would have done in this uh, situation. Well, I can tell you what I might have done. If I had a motorcycle, now's the time to hit the road. And uh, uh, I would have uh, hightailed it out of there. I don't have a motorcycle. I have a minivan. Good enough. We'll, uh, we'll make it out of town and we'll try to dodge this, uh, this bullet. Uh, but then we notice this about Daniel. Uh, here's the course of action that he takes after that. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to his three companions. And I might just say that Daniel informed his friends so they could pray together. together. Um, listen, we should be willing to pray for each other. And oftentimes there's things that come in our life of a personal nature that we don't want to share uh, everything. But you know what? If you take the initiative, you can share what needs to be shared and your friends can pray with you. You don't need to bear the burdens, even though there are burdens. And what does the scripture say? And, or Paul says, in the final, we all bear our own burdens but we also carry one another's burdens. It's a good thing to have friends, to talk about this, to pray together. And that's exactly what these four young people did. I don't know um, how old they are. If they were 17, that means they're 19. Can you imagine? Uh, or 18 years old. Four 18-year-old teenagers sitting together and having a prayer meeting. And while they're doing that, while he comes back, uh, the revelation, which is God's word, comes to Daniel. Then uh, uh, verse 18, uh, they got together that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Then Daniel and his fellows, and by the way, the secret right there, they knew there is no way without God's help they could figure this out. They knew that. They are depending on God the whole way. That Daniel and his fellows should not perish. Verse 19, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a vision. Now there's no indication that this was a dream. This is a vision. This is a supernatural event that God is showing Daniel. And he's seeing it. Um, and uh, there's nothing here that says he fell asleep or was tired or anything like that. Um, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And we had Daniel's prayer of thanks. And we read it this morning uh, for our scripture reading. What a prayer. And what we have is a response to the word of God. Look at, look at what he says uh, right here. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Notice the words, Daniel answered. What did he answer? He answered the word of God. 
he answered the revelation that was given. And so we could kind of uh, see a little definition of prayer right here. It's a response to the word of God. And that's what Daniel did. And uh, his prayer is based on an understanding of God. And as we stop and think about it, uh, omniscience is throughout this prayer. God knows everything. And Daniel makes it known. Uh, notice, Daniel doesn't talk about himself. It's all about who God is. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He knows everything, omniscience. He's all-powerful. Uh, his sovereignty. He's the one who sets up kings and takes down kings. Daniel recognizes God is in control. But he also says this. He, verse 22, revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Uh, God has revealed, and today he's revealed himself through his word. Uh, remember what the Chaldeans told the king? What you're asking only the gods know, and they're not talking. They're not revealing a thing. What a contrast between the God of Daniel and his three friends and the gods of the Chaldeans. The gods of the Chaldeans are useless. And they admit it. Can't help you, king. And Daniel said, the God of heaven, I have confidence. And he actually went into the king and said, give me time. God is going to show me the answer. And he goes back with his friends. They have a prayer meeting. And this is uh, uh, what, they, uh, uh, what they come up with. What a prayer that Daniel has. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an amazing uh, thing. Uh, then, uh, verse 23, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now that we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. And just notice, Daniel takes no credit himself. It's uh, all thankfulness to God. Therefore, because of that, Daniel went into Arioch, verse 24, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men. He was in charge of the, of the death camp. He went and said, thou unto him, don't destroy. Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said, uh, thus unto him, I have found a man. Notice, he's taking credit for it. Um, now you got to love these guys. Uh, the officer, uh, you know, this is his doing. Really, Ariok, you found him? Yeah, right. I have found a man of the captives of Ju Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. And Daniel comes in, and the king answers and says to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, and the king no doubt addressed him as Belshazzar, are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And now we'll close with Daniel's answer. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, None of your religion can help you. They can't show you a thing. But in contrast, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king of Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. And... Uh, uh, Literally, as we stop and think, and I'll, I'll end there, but in verse 29, we have a hint of what's going through Nebuchadnezzar's head. Nebuchadnezzar rose to power in kind of a unique way. His dad had died, and 
He is now in charge of this empire, and he's thinking this. What's going to happen next? And that's in his mind. And he has a dream about it. And God uses the dream to show Nebuchadnezzar what's going to happen next. And, uh, and so, uh, I don't know if uh, any of you have ever been thinking about things, and sure enough, you have a dream about it. And uh, that's what happened uh, to Nebuchadnezzar in this particular case. Well, let's, uh, let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a God in heaven who reveals to us all that we need to know. We thank you that as sinners, we can read in your word that there's nothing we can do about our sin. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us, to pay the penalty, a penalty we could never pay ourselves. We thank you for that revelation. And we thank you that you have made a promise to us that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand together and we'll sing the last verse of How Great Thou Art. Thank you for coming. And in leaving, let me read to you Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank you. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.